What's happening? Welcome to the 69th episode of the Slap Stream with Georgia. Uh, feels really good to be saying what's happening again. I know I've been on a short hiatus. I was in Europe, I was traveling a lot. It was kind of almost impossible to do it. So I decided, all right, so I'll take a little break and come back. So we're back. Hopefully I'm going to be back uh, here on my YouTube channel on a regular schedule every Saturday at 11 a.m. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, make sure to hit that subscribe button and slap that like. Thanks a lot for everybody that's been supporting the channel and my work through uh, Patreon. If you haven't signed up for the Patreon, check out the link in the description um, through Venmo, PayPal, for just sharing the link, for... Um, just joining the conversation and everything else um and for buying the merchandise if you want one of these art of slab slot art of slab based t-shirts like this one i have a couple designs available so go to the link in the description as well all right without further ado i would like to introduce my today's guest He's an American. He's a, the American from the band The Americans. I love that band. I love his playing. And I'm really happy to introduce him for you here in my show. Uh, Jacob Faulkner. How's it going, Georgia? How's it going, man? Oh, very well indeed. Really glad to be here. I got to say, I told you beforehand, but it's really an honor to be uh, a part of this. I'm really glad you were able to make it. We've been talking about this for a long time, and we're finally here in Slapsville. And for a while, I was not able to do these live, and now I'm like, okay, so I can do this live, and it still stays on YouTube so people can check it out, but it's kind of fun to do it live as well. Uh, how have you been during this whole end-of-the-world pandemic thing? Well, have you been uh, playing? Uh, yeah, I've, uh, you know... So I play with the American. That's that's what um, really keeps me going. And we finished a record right before the pandemic started, and then decided to wait on it until now. We're putting it out in April, so it's been a lot of like we have this really great thing, and we don't have anywhere to put it or show it off yet. Um, also, I uh, I got invited to join uh, the old folk group, the Kingston Trio. So I've been on the road with them for about a year now, and that's been really great too, playing all those old songs. That's awesome. And I read in, and you told me about that. So it's, it's really cool. Oh, and you were looking for somebody to sub for you somewhere in New England recently, right? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a conflict of dates because uh, the Americans, you know, that's what I have to, that's what I need to show up for every time. So I've got to yeah, have yeah, yeah. for a date on, in March. Is that for South by Southwest? Yeah, we're going to be there for South by. Um, I, I should know the venue name, but uh, we're playing March 18th. It's, have you ever played South by? Yeah, we were there a couple of years ago and uh, I think maybe even twice now or something like that, but huh. it's a, it's a, it's a mess, but it's fun. It's an interesting mess. Yeah. yeah. I played that only twice. I think it was a chaos every time. I, I think that I would prefer like to go attend the show than actually play. <laughs> uh, just load in load out to all these people and it's and i like mess i like chaos yeah I like, but you know, but you know most people are rolling in with a guitar over their shoulder we have a oh yeah, yeah. Carry. yeah it's 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 a pain um well i'm glad you've been keeping busy and uh i would like to cover you know you're kind of like your whole career as i usually do on these slap <laughs> streams uh since um you know, we as bass players don't don't get that many chances to present our point of view. And I would like to kind of present like all of us that are that, that dedicated, you know, our life to upright bass and especially slab bass. So um, let's start with the beginning. Uh, how did you get interested in music? How did you start? What was your first instrument? How did you pick your bass? So I started out on guitar and um, I was given Bob Dylan's first record and a, uh, I got uh, obsessed with country blues recordings in the 20s and 30s. Uh, I got uh, the great fortune and also the misfortune of playing with guys like Zach Sokolow and Patrick Ferris and the Americans, who are as good a guitar players, if not better than me. So I had to find a way to keep hanging out. 
So uh, a friend of mine had a bass that was kind of hanging out at my house, and I started picking it up, and I was immediately interested in slap playing, because in high school I got into rockabilly, especially the early 50s stuff, that's what really uh, interested me. And so I just threw myself headlong in, and actually uh, watching your videos all the way uh, back in the mid-2000s uh, was an inspiration of like, you can, you can do that, with a bass, because you know, I mostly heard just single clicking and double clicking and stuff. Um, but to see somebody really explode with these triplets and these counter rims and everything, it was really mind blowing to see. Um, but yeah, uh, so I started out with a background in country and 20s and 30s blues and some jazz and hung out with the whole old time scene in LA. Uh, guys like Frank Fairfield and Blasting Company and all those guys. Um, and always had the rock and roll thing going with the Americans and we were doing rockabilly and country and our version of rock and roll and uh, have just been playing ever since, you know, that, that's sort of the, the short of it, I guess. For some reason, I thought that you, 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 you started like with jazz and blues, but you actually started with rockabilly. I didn't, I, I was not aware of that. And when you were playing uh, guitar, were you also interested, were you also doing the same style or? With guitar, I was doing a lot more finger style, more along the Chet Atkins or oh, okay. Travis. So the, the jazz stuff was always there, but it was, uh, you know, I, I was two fiving with uh, with guitars, not basses. So you immediately kind of started with good stuff, which is great. Yeah, I got really lucky on that front. I, I, uh, That's awesome. I, I owned a couple bad records when I was about 12 years old, and my mom called a, a family friend of ours who took me to Amoeba and just sort of... Uh, set me straight. <laughs> uh -huh. He got me Dr. John's Gree Gree and Stooges first record and um, and the Carter family. And those were sort of the things that sort of guided my taste through. That's great. And uh, how old were you when you started playing upright bass? Uh, I'd say that I got real serious um, when I was about 19. Um, okay. But I've been fooling around this since I was about like probably 16, 17. Uh, but I, I like I went and bought myself a bass. A guy was moving to Nashville. Actually, this same bass. This bass is as a story. It's a 1942 Slingmaster uh, that somebody did a really bad paint job on. Uh, and over the years, it's kind of cut, the bits and pieces have come off. Uh, it was stolen at one point, and uh, huge credit to Patrick Ferris again uh, from the Americans for tracking down all of our instruments. Uh, and so this guy was gone and returned um, and. I just had her rebuilt by Tom over at Fantastic Musical Instruments, uh, and it plays great again. So, uh, all right, huge shout out to Patrick. You know, that's how I actually discovered you. I jammed with him when I was a plane with a bluegrass band uh, in up in Davis or Sacramento. He was studying there or something, right? Yeah, he was over at UC Davis, uh, hanging out with the KBVS people as well. Yeah, so I that's when i met him and how and we were jamming some Johnny burnett i was like yeah this guy's cool i i, I like this dude <laughs> and then i haven't heard from him for for a couple of years and then uh then i guess i moved down to la and then he, he was and then he was uh, as well and then he he had the band he had the uh, the americans and then i heard you a couple times at what was it uh cantina viva cantina oh god yeah that uh that that, that's, a, that's a funny little venue. I'll, I'll, I'll love to Ribbon Martini and all the people who put the show together. Yes. That, is, that is not a stellar venue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's definitely an interesting venue. It had that kind of uh, foyer at the beginning that when you get in, the entrances was kind of like for kind of always for a cheesy electric <laughs> blues band. And it was something cool in the back going on, like the rock yeah, exactly. or Western swing or something. Surfy. Nor yeah. our stuff like I, I i loved it that during that time i was living in in the valley and then it was it was kind of the, the place to go i love mm -hmm. going down there is that venue still around you know i don't know um i don't know yet i, I assume it still is but I, I can't say for sure but she's not probably booking shows there anymore i think no i'm i'm, I'm just we uh we, we became so interested in playing our kind of version of rock and roll that we will still play rockabilly for parties and friends and stuff but <clears throat> we we uh professionally play our own music these days you're on our, you're our on. set was all found recordings from the 50s 
you know, we we went really deep and tried to find all kinds of the all of the obscure stuff because that's what we like to play. That's what we like to listen to. It's great. I mean, you know, when I heard you, it was like that was the thing, you know, and that's something that I appreciate the most from all the bands when I hear their own music and their own their own style. That's kind of the highlight, but you know, at least you know playing your own songs and that's what you guys did and then i loved it and patrick's voice like really fits well with it it's 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 really cool so yeah. whoever He's is watching the live stream too. if you haven't heard the americans make sure to do that um but you are originally from la as well right yeah i grew up in la over in dennis and no, that's that, was, nice. that was a blast i uh, i grew up in a giant warehouse uh, about 10,000 square feet my family are artists and oh wow it, can't imagine it, it was it was um, it was a uh, terrific amount of fun because we had this uh, <clears throat> huge warehouse and on the side was a loft where we lived and my, uh, my parents lived way in the back and on the other half of the house was my brother and i we had this huge room that used to be the offices and we the walls got knocked down so we just had this huge room and you know on an average day we'd have like uh, what would become the americans three of my brother's friends and Four other people just all crashed out all through this place, and we'd all be wake up and play music. We were hanging out a lot with John Paxton at the time, Blind Boy Paxton. He'd come over a bunch, and uh, we did just a lot of music uh, back then. And that was right when uh, Attic Kinney was at Wildest. There's my cat. Uh, his name is Blue Ellen. He's a good guy. Um, there he goes. And uh, yeah, the uh, it was it was that special time in the mid two thousands. Well, mid to late thousands over on on at Kinney. Yeah, uh, the stronghold was having all the crazy parties, and we were playing there all the time. It was great growing up in Venice. That's so cool. Is that is that place still around? The stronghold is. They're not the same. They don't have. They used to have this huge upstairs thing where it was definitely not legal, and they were just throwing parties all the time. And they were uh -huh. interested in heritage American music, so. It was us and the dough rollers and whoever else was coming through. That's so cool. For how for how long have you been? You've been living there, right? What's that? You've been living in that that place, right? Oh uh, no! So that was my parents' place. Uh, okay. When, uh, when I was growing up, and they've now moved out to Malibu, uh, ah. and uh, which is where my stepdad's originally from. So it was sort of a return home for him. Uh, mm -hmm. But now, uh, now my wife and I and the cat live in Los Feliz. Oh, okay. All right, yeah. you're still in LA. It's for some reason, I think it's really hard to leave LA once you're it's, like, it's, yeah, it's, 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 like, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a complicated city. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, besides music business and everything else, it's you get used to these. We get spoiled with this weather, and yeah, especially uh, coming off the road, you know, like you and I do. Uh, you, you, you're out for two weeks and someplace awful. And cold, and then you come back here, and it's February or January, and it's like seventy-two. That's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, yesterday, I went to the beach. It was great. How yeah. often do you go to the beach? Um, you know, because my parents are out in Malibu. I'm there every, every couple of weeks or so. Okay, it's yeah. nice. All right, let's get back to music and back to 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 <laughs> to bass. So, so you started playing bass around. Uh, you said like nineteen. You got like serious and. And that was primarily country and rockabilly, but you were also studying. I, I know that you, you yeah, went, went to Cal, Cal Arts. Arts, right? Yeah, I went to, I went to Cal Arts and studied music there. Um, and, you know, because I was so interested in rural styles, uh, it was a little tough. I learned a lot of basically left-hand technique there and how to get up, get up and down the neck. That was uh, what I think I really picked up uh, during my time at Cal Arts as far as bass playing goes. Um, but there was no one there who knew about slap. And if you wanted to like, if you wanted to do some bow work, it was going to be very classical based, which is fantastic. But uh, I like that really kind of one fiving uh, Central European, Eastern European sound out of it. So it was a different sort of thing. That's something that you're, you excel at actually. Um, so, uh, and so who, was, who was your teacher over there? Bass teacher. Bass teacher. Um, it's I, I, I'm embarrassed now. It's uh, it was his, his name is his first name is Peter and. Okay. He, uh, the, I think second chair at okay. the LA Phil, um, and it's, and is it uh, uh so so it was mostly classical bass at the Cal Arts? 
it was it was a mix of uh, a bit of classical, a bit of jazz. It was sort of uh, colored by I didn't care about learning either, so I just really wanted to focus on learning how to slap and learning how to play all these older styles, you know. So if I was learning jazz, I was learning, uh, you know, if I was if I was learning jazz, I, I was learning Dinah or something like that, and how to how to really work uh, work my way around a tune like that. Whereas everybody else was, you know, into you know, and really advanced post tonal stuff and uh, harmonic stuff. So yeah, I'm, to me, it was the bass has always been sort of a mixture of uh, harmonic uh, weightiness and I guess I always think of myself as sort of the bus driver uh, when I'm playing bass. I'm, I'm keeping everybody else on the road. And you know, one of the things I've always admired in all the uh, uh, videos you post and all the, all the stuff you do is you show all these amazing guys who can really tear up and down the bass. And uh, as, as, as much slapping as I can do and I can you know, get my way around this thing. I've never had that, uh, that I, I, my, my focus has always been on, on serving the band more than taking leads. Um, and so that was, that was always, that's always been my focus. That should be the focus, focus for every, every bass player, you know, supporting the band and being a team player. I think that's yeah. why we also like to support each other. So it's, it's, uh, there's, I feel there's less kind of, um, competition in between bass players than other other um, instrumental players. What would you say, like uh, your uh, studies at Cal Arts and th those like more uh, traditional way of studying music and bass? How much did that help you uh, with uh, playing in a band and playing playing uh, playing I, music? I think... that you, do you like? So I think my formal studies um, saved my body because when I started playing bass, um, I had terrible technique and I hurt myself actually, um, you know, just tore muscles and stuff. I was playing so much with, with the Americans and it wasn't until I went back to like, that I really sat down and when I came back to school after this, I, you know, I, after injuring myself, that I really learned, you know, my hand positions and, and how to, you know, use my weight into my instrument and all those kind of things. And I can't imagine, uh, I mean, there are amazing players who don't have any of that, but I can't imagine for myself not having had the sort of formal training to not hurt myself uh, while, while playing it because this instrument's terribly hard on your body if you're not careful. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a tricky one. Um, I would love to hear you play a little bit and you have your bass with you. So yeah. uh, do you want to show us a little bit of bass playing uh this is a piece that um i i i a uh, little bit of this a little bit of that but i'm gonna call it uh to get the good graces of my wife it's just called reading which is her name Thank mm -hmm. you. 
All right. I. What did you say? What is the name? What is the name of the piece? The name of the piece is Rian after my wife. Okay. And with, have uh, you recorded it already with someone, or is no, it just like no. a piece? It's a. Uh, so it starts out with a, it's got a strong borrow in the beginning from a, I play a lot of old Italian music, uh, mazurkas and waltzes with, uh, with Zach Sokolo from the Americans and Frank Fairfield sometimes and David Elsenbroich who has a great band on Wednesday nights over at 1642. But we all play this old Italian stuff and so we, uh, I stole that intro from Cello Stellato. The, the, and uh, all those mazurkas and stuff I just love, I love it. And also the bass line on that stuff is just, yeah. And there's, so there's no there's no lead playing on my end, but I thought I would learn some of it to try to, you know, because this half of the neck we we uh, this is this is our this this is our just desserts. <laughs> you know, you don't get to go up there very often, so I thought I would try to work on that by by learning some of those old Italian tunes. Uh, but the rest of it, uh, yeah, uh, from there I just went on and. You know, wrote a piece of the wife. How often do you play slap in the thumb position? Oh, uh, uh, in the I try to always, I, I often try to find a way to work it in. Um, you know, when the Americans are playing rockabilly, obviously it's just about every other song, if not every song. Um, but when we're writing our original material, I'll try to find a section. You know, if we need to lift it a little bit because I think part of the job as a bass player is that we really control a lot like almost as much as the drummer we really control uh the dynamics and the intensity you know uh and we make decisions uh especially in, in our not just in the uh timbre and the intensity that we play in but also in our octave choice you know we can we can play a whole song high and then when you want to drive it home you can uh, drop an octave or you can start slapping, and that adds a whole different set of colors that can really push a song. You know, uh, especially because um, my wife taught me this term, but it's called the duende, and it's, it's uh, from flamenco music. And it's just it's the the electricity of, of when somebody has the duende, they are, they have tapped into the electricity. And I think of a, a medium like uh, like rockabilly and also jazz and all the, but all these very live mediums. It's all about pushing the, whoever's in the front of that moment, whether that be the guitar or the bass or the singer, to that next place. You know, you'll listen to the, you were mentioning Johnny Burnett, you'll hear, uh, you'll, you'll hear them going and all of a sudden Johnny's yelling, uh, you know, get, go, and, and all of a sudden you hear the guitar player come up. And you can hear it on all these old jazz recordings too. You know, you hear the, you hear the band come in and they're doing their thing and the next thing you know, somebody takes a solo that makes it, just soar, and so it's all about pushing people into the uh, releasing their their inner duende or something like that. I guess I like that, and I like also that you mentioned that um, that having uh, uh, that plain slap it's kind of like a different color, and which I completely agree with you. And I think that more players that are able to play, you know, with a bow or pizzicato. You know, should learn slap because it just adds even the, just the basics. It it uh, it adds a different color, like to a palette. It's uh, and I I find because you, know, you were asking about, about slapping and it's like you know I just said that big old triplety based thing, um, but most of the time when I'm slapping around, I'm, it's usually just snap stuff, uh, and that's actually the snap stuff I learned from watching you and. Um, Oh, I've just, I feel so silly. I've just lost the bass player's name. Uh, the great uh, New Orleans bass player. Um, Bill Johnson, Pop Bill Spider. Johnson. And, yeah, okay. Bill Johnson uh, is just so classy with his snapping, you know? It, uh, he'll, he'll, he'll throw things in there, but they're always tasteful. But it's, it's all very kind of snap and not, not slap based. And I, I really learned a lot. You were the one who showed me Bill Johnson uh, or, you know, by just uh, putting it out there. And it uh, really changed my playing because before that I was doing all kind of country, you know, snap, slap, snap, slap. And to learn that I could just go like. It also just opens up your ability to 
be more expressive because when you're when you're stuck in a uh, you know a single or a double rhythm, you're 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 stuck there. And being able to jump around more like that was really changing for my playing. We're gonna talk about that um, snap slap that you mentioned, like you know the 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 names for different slap patterns a little bit later on. I'm gonna uh, pick your brain about it. Um, but before we get into that, I would like to we we started we stopped kind of like around call arts and then th did you did you get interested in different different music styles around that time and explored I know that you played a bunch of different things so oh yeah so, you like, know, uh, tell tell us a little bit more about it so yeah uh well let's see um you know of course there's always been the obsession with old american music that that's always been sort of the the precedent for me um, but I got into all kinds of uh, rock and uh, I'm trying to think, uh, you know, really, you know, I, I've, I've always loved listening to most types of music. Um, so really, uh, to me, it's about when, when you, when CalArts really gave me the clarity to see that music is it's, it's cliche, but music is a language. And what I mean by that is as soon as you come to understand that people are just expressing uh, these ideas that, that words don't really grasp onto, you suddenly have a passport to all kinds of music. And you suddenly are uh, not necessarily allowed to, but if you, if you put in the work, you can enjoy music from all over the world because you, you start to thirst and, and crave uh, that level of excitement. Uh, for example, with, we were, I was talking about the Duende and I was saying that there are certain genres that really encourage that. And uh, when, when, you're, when what you're looking for is that rather than the sound of a Gretsch uh, or the sound of a certain kind of thing, you, when, you're, when, you're, when you're lusting for the emotional quality of the music, uh, music opens up to you. And I really learned to appreciate that over at CalArts. You know that that's one of the uh, conservatories that I was thinking to uh, to attend when I when I moved to the U.S. and uh, a friend of mine, uh, Miroslav Tadic, teaches over there. Of course, and, Miroslav is the man. Yeah, have you? Did you take any any classes I, I from took, him? Uh, I, I took. Uh, I never got to take any lessons, uh, uh, music, uh, guitar lessons from him, but I mm -hmm. got to take his history of blues and American music. And uh, it was wonderful. He was he was great. He uh, his discussion of Booker White, what he called uh, "slap the baby" when Booker White would do that technique where he goes and hits the strings and hits the back of his uh, uh, resonator. Great sound that he did in the uh, the fifties and sixties recordings he did, or just sixties recordings. I don't think he recorded in the fifties. He's such an amazing player. Have you ever have you ever jammed with him? You know, I didn't. I didn't get the chance to jam with Miroslav, and I would have loved to have. He's um, he's great, you know. His mind is somewhere else. It's just yeah. Like, he, I remember when I was playing with Fish Tank Ensemble, mm -hmm. uh, one of our fans who was his uh, student at the time asked him to 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 help her uh, learn that song, and he learned it. And then I jammed that song with him, and it was it was kind of like the best performance of that song, and it was something <laughs> not the easiest thing i believe it was something in five eight and seven eight kind of combination like one bar five one seven but but he nailed it and it was just it was just not playing it it was it was i don't know something else. The universe it. opened up <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a uh he's he's brilliant and he's so well studied and careful and yet the, like uh like we were I'm going back to this idea that one day you can study yourself out of being able to explode, uh, I think. And that's, that's, of course, the fear of going the, the university route is that you can become so versed in the technicalities that you lose the capacity to be, be expressive. And he is the perfect example of here's a man who is perfectly studied and yet can be just visionary uh, and, and uh, you know, brilliant in his in his in his performances. He's great. He's actually one of well, the guys that told me, like, hey, you, you already tour. You already do what all these students want to do. 
just don't go back to school. It's yeah. like, fine. You have a conservatory. It's it's a good. It's if it's you you'll be good. And it's interesting that you mentioned that because I always thought that for some people it's really really helpful to have that um that kind of like a traditional way of studying and learning music. And I I would say that I am one of those guys because I think that for me uh, uh studying uh, classical music and jazz music at the conservatory really kind of brought out my my way of thinking about music and understanding the music so so i'm i'll be forever thankful to that and but there's like tons of guys that are really stuck into that and that they can't get out of it and then they those are the guys that should go to bars and play you know shitty gigs and 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 go on tour in a in a van, uh, and um, well, but it's, it's interesting. Yeah. That as, as technically proficient as you as you are, if you're playing a honky tonk, you need to be able to grab the attention of everybody in the bar. And no matter how good your riff is, if you're not able to say it with expression and meaning, and not if you're not able to actually, you know, say like you're just playing notes at them, and they don't care. Because they're, 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 they, they, people have, generally speaking, like decent taste. They, they, they know a good thing when they hear it. And uh, it's an interesting perspective, and I, I, I agree with you. And um, so after w- once you finished, and so at the color arts, you studied bass or you studied composition or music in general. What, what so I was in a program called the Musical Arts Program, which was sort of oh. a make your own uh, thing. So I studied bass and a little bit of composition. And also a lot of music production. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I put on uh, several shows while I was there, uh, based on the late uh, great Hal Wilner, who would do these fantastic tribute shows. So he would do a night of Disney songs, but he gets everybody from Tom Waits to Sinead O'Connor to come in and do different songs. You know, all, all really all over the place. He, he's a, he's a genius. I'm actually. He passed right before the, uh, or at the beginning of the pandemic from, uh, from COVID. Um, and he was a family friend of mine, the same guy who brought me to Amiibo when I was young. Uh, so I'm producing a, uh, I'm a part of the production team, I should say, that's doing a concert for him in April uh, in his honor uh, over at St. Anne's in early, uh, I think it's April 7th for his birthday. Wow, that's, that's, that's really cool. That's really cool. Um, I think that studying is also kind of important, the most important for kind of connections. And, and that's where you get some contacts that you can keep for life. Yeah. And, 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 and like and build like friendships that is kind of necessary for your future career as well. Yeah. So I, uh, um, what was like, oh, I forgot to ask you, what was the name and what kind of music have you played with your first band? Oh, that embarrassing history. Um, I was the singer in a ska band when I was uh, 14, 15 years old called the Black Jack Gypsies, uh, followed by a run with a group called the Revelators in which I played electric bass. Uh, and then uh, I had another group uh, called the Doppelgang, and that was my first foray into rockabilly. I had a uh, a uh, beautiful girl lead singer and an upright bass. And I was playing a uh, national guitar. And that's actually was the first band I had was Zach Soplo from the Americans. And after high school ended, we uh, pretty quickly knew that we wanted to have something going on. So we started a group called the 1921A with a fantastic songwriter named Christian B. Hudson, who's doing great right now. He's signed to Anti and... Um, so we had this very kind of artsy Tom Waits knockoff band for a while called the 1921A. And then after that, it's been the Americans and then playing all kinds of side projects here and there. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm also a jug player uh, coming from the old time world. So I play this jug with a bunch of people and bass and all of that. Uh, but yeah, so that was sort of the chronology. And then it finally came to the Americans and that was the thing I really wanted to play because those guys have been my best friends since I was, you know, 15 years old. And was was Patrick uh, 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 the, the from the very beginning? I know he was the ben- beginning from the Americans, but it, so it seems that you too started the band. Yeah. So uh, 
Patrick and I wanted, we, we met in high school when we were about 15 and uh, we both loved the White Stripes and Bob Dylan and Old Blues. And that was enough, you know, when you're that age, that, that's, a, that's the best friendship right there. And uh, so we just carried on from, from that point. And when he finished UC Davis, he moved down to LA with the intention of we're going to start a band together and that's how we're going to do this. We're just going to go from there. How did you find the other two guys? So Zach, uh, the lead guitar player, was hanging out. There's a, a guitar store in Los Angeles called Caves, and it's where if you're if you're into folk music, you you know Caves and you've played Caves. It's it's just sort of a, a staple. Um, this is the one and, in Santa Monica, right? Yes, exactly. Thirty first oh. and Pico. Um, and uh, I remember I was learning Diddy Wah Diddy by uh, Blind Blake. And I walked in there one day and there was this kid with his legs kicked up behind the desk uh, and he was picking it better than I could and I hated it. Absolutely could not stand the guy for about six months and then I realized I should stop being a jerk and happen to join my band instead and that was the doppelgang. So uh -huh. Zach, uh, Zach grew up in a very musical household. His family celebrated Elvis's birthday. His father has literally written books and books and books on uh, guitar technique and teaches Fred Sokolo is an amazing and, uh, and a great banjo player too. So Zach is one of those terrifying multi-instrumentalists, uh, guitar, mandolin, banjo, fiddle. Um, and so it just seemed like a very logical trio with Zach with Patrick's strong voice and great guitar playing and Zach's stunning multi-instrumentalism. And Zach, uh, to, for my money, I think is the best rockabilly guitar player, you know, up there with any of the greats. Uh, and then I struggled and got good on Bates after a couple of years. So the, the, the three of us were a team. Uh, we met our first two drummers at CalArts. Um, and then uh, most recently we're working with a gentleman named Nick Baker, who's another CalArtsian actually. Uh, and Nick, Zach, and I play Thursday nights at the Roosevelt Hotel, playing kind of a latin -y jazz thing that we've kind of invented. Huh. I'd like yeah. to check that out. Where's that? The Roosevelt Hotel over on Hollywood Boulevard. Awesome. Well, I'll check that out. Every Thursday? Yeah, every Thursday, 6.30 to 9.30, if I'm in town. I mean, the guys will still be there, but I, I'm, I'm not happy here with the trio. Oh, somebody somebody subs for you sometimes? Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. I'll check it out. Are you going to be here next Thursday? I'll be here, I think, all month, pretty much. All right. I'll make sure to check you out at least once. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so, did were you play? Were you able to play over there, like during the pandemic, during the whole time, or? So uh, the uh, Roosevelt started back up because we were we were there before the pandemic, and then it shut down for a while. And this is only got going probably about six months ago again. Uh, the, the the first group that started going back out for me was the Kingston Trio, and uh, they were doing Florida and Texas and places where they just decided that it wasn't a thing. Actually, a funny story is uh, the trio's show is really built around uh, audience participation and singing along coming from that you know, great tradition that Pete Seeger started. So uh, we were in, it was February of 2021 uh, when we started going out again, we went to Florida and it was the first uh, gig that they had booked at this venue. And what they decided to do is sell out the show that was going to be 1200 people by or 1600 people by putting it into four shows with 400 people at a time allowed in this venue which as you know feel, would feel terrible because all of a sudden it feels like nobody's in the audience there's not a you know there's 400 people spread out in a 1600 person venue it was awful um and then the kicker is that the person who booked it thought they were being really clever because they booked the kingston trio everybody in their age range that's going to see the show for the most part are 65 plus so they're all going to have their vaccination which we thought at the time was just going to solve everything but the uh they turn around and we go up on stage and we play our opening tune and the third song and he says i want everybody here to sing along you know like pete Seeger said there's no such thing as a wrong note as long as you're the one singing it. And I will look to my side and I saw the stage manager just panic. And after the our intermission, she came up to me and said, you know, 
I can't have you encouraging people to sing right now because uh, we'll be sued <laughs> because there's a church coming in for Easter and we told them you can't have the congregation sing right now uh, because of, because of, of spreading COVID. Uh, so then we had to rewrite our whole show for the rest of the thing, but I just thought that was uh, too funny that they thought they had found the perfect answer to the beginning of the uh, return of the concerts. And we turn around and we're like, yeah, everybody sing along. And they're like, oh, you can't do that. Wow. That's yeah. interesting. So, so just to make sure, uh, the, the, uh, the, is there anybody else but besides three of them in a band? Uh, so the Kingston Trio, uh, for the Americans or the Trio? My ah, Kingston Trio. So the Kingston Trio has been handed down. Uh, it's now all second generation. Okay. Uh, one so there's the, no no original members. No, uh, Bob Sheen passed away about okay. uh, two years ago. And uh, the original three guys were Dave Gard, Nick Reynolds, and Bob Shane. Nick Reynolds yep. took in the uh, current band leader, Mike Marvin, when he was an errant teenager. And he grew up in that household and he learned all the songs from them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, all, it's all in house still. Um, it's just uh, a new, it's a new broom. <laughs> oh, yeah, I bet. I mean, the band started in the 50s, right? Uh, 1957. Wow. Uh Well, and how is it playing with them? Is it? Is it's it... a, it's a, it's. I mean, it's a thrill, uh, and a thrill? It's, it's really. Uh, I didn't know how. I've never been in a band that would uh, have a stage bid. You know, I've always been with the Americans who are, who are very focused, and we, you know, cut to black between songs, and we just start playing the next song, or it's a thank you very much, and then uh, so to be up there and be part of the jokes and the, the whole dance of it has been a lot of fun. I really enjoy that part of it. Also, it's just, uh, I get to play Where Have All the Flowers Gone and Tom Dooley and This Land is Your Land and not feel at all like I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you've had this experience too because you played with such serious people of like, I'm doing the thing. I'm not covering the thing. Um, I'm actually, like, I get to play this because I'm, I'm part of that band. That's nice. Is there anybody else besides uh, the Americans and Kingston Trio that uh, you would like to mention from the people that you that you played with? Oh, I mean, there's so many people I, I love. Um, you know, uh, right now, the other group I'm playing with is La Lone, which is uh, the Los Angeles League of Musicians. That's the Thursday night at the Roosevelt. And uh, I have to give a huge shout out to uh, the Blasting Company and Carlos y Charlos. Uh, you know, just Zach Sokolo on his own as a banjo player and a multi-instrumentalist, he is really incredible. Frank Fairfield is wonderful. Blind Boy Paxton. I could just go on and on. These are all guys that have their uh, honor player. You know who I need to mention is Clinton Davis. Uh, he is a old-time musician based out of San Diego, and uh, he's hired me several times to play everything from tenor banjo to jug. And He just put out a new record, and it's really good, really beautiful. Um, so check out Clinton Davis and, and get ready for the next Americans record. Uh, when is that one coming out? That's going to be coming out in the spring. Oh, you don't have a date yet? What do you we're, have a title? We, we can't quite say yet, but it's going to be, uh, in the year, like mid spring. Oh, so whoever wants to, uh, find out about it, you know, they should, you know, go to your. TheAmericansMusic.com, all of our socials, uh, at TheAmericansMusic, all that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, and all these links, I mean, your links are in the description of this video. But uh, you update your website often, so whoever is interested in what you are doing, not just the Americans, they should go to Jake, JacobFaulkner.com, right? Yes, please. And you can find that I also, on a good day, I'm a composer and uh have been throwing my my weight around there as, as as hard as i can that's awesome uh i noticed on your website that you're saying about um a sound of rogues gallery that's uh that you produced there that that one right no no that was how wilmer who produced that the, the late ah, okay. we, were, we were fortunate enough to be a part of it uh, ah the... okay so you pre But so were like a Keith Richards and Tom Waits part of it, or what was the thing? Yeah. So uh, what this is uh, Hal's genius at work is that okay. he could 
uh, get together Keith Richards and Tom Waits to come in and sing Shenandoah together, you know, or oh, so have you played with them? Uh, I've played with Tom Waits. I've not played with Keith Richards. Oh, wow. So how was it playing with Tom Waits? Come on, mention that. A, a frightening dream come true. The, wow. the highlight of the whole event uh, was that we shot fireworks later and he was running through the firework with a tape recorder, catching the sound. At one point, the firework veered off and went into a gutter and he looked and went, they're angry down there. They're <laughs> always angry down there. And uh, yeah, I mean, does, it doesn't get much better than getting to uh, shake Tom Waits' hand. That's great. So, uh, how many songs you pl you, you played with him? Well, it was it was informal. Ah, okay. Yeah. Oh, so it was more like a jamming. It was not part of the show. This this wasn't for the sort of rose gallery. This was a different occasion. Ah, okay, okay, got yeah. it. Well, that 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 must have been fun. Yeah, I did. Uh, uh, the Americans did a, a tune with Nick Cave, though, uh, at a Hal Bomber show, which was really thrilling. Oh, where was that? Uh, uh, that uh, was at the Ace Gallery. Or, I mean, not the Ace Gallery, excuse me. That's a, that's a whole art world thing. Uh, the Ace Theater in downtown L.A. Uh, that was for another Hal Bomber show. We, we were celebrating the, I want to say, 75th anniversary, or maybe 65th anniversary, of uh, Allen Ginsberg's poem, Howl, being released. And, oh, uh, nice! I'll put I, I, I love that venue. I played there with a the Tiger Army a couple times. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's, that's so how did that? How did that uh, collaboration with Nick Cave came? Uh, they wanted uh, they they, uh, they were doing boat song to end the show, and it was him. And Beth, it was uh, both Nick and Beth Orton, and we were already set up and on stage. So they were like, "Why don't you guys, you know, play a lot of, uh, be be the be the band for that one?" And it was, it was, I mean, uh, that's a whole different kind of dark genius. Uh, uh, a friend of mine lovingly calls Nick Cave goth Bob Dylan, which I always thought was pretty funny. Uh, but I, I, I'm uh, such a fan of Nick Cave's. I, I think what he does is so serious and focused, and I really appreciate that in, in the arts. It's, it's such a clear voice of his. It's great. I love I, I love Nick Cave and Tom Waits. And you know, for for a while, for a long time, I was obsessed with their music. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's awesome music. You had a chance to play with both of them. Really, really, really cool. And um, uh, so, it, it, as you mentioned, uh, Nick Cave. So that was that show, uh, Angel Headed Hipster, or there was something else? Yes, that was Angel Headed Hipster. Okay. No, Angel Headed Hipster. Excuse me. Uh, is the is another? These are, these are all uh, Hal Wilmer projects, which of course we're going to be doing the show over at St. Anne's in New York uh, in, in April. Angel okay. Hip Hipster was uh, the last project that Hal got to work on before he passed. It was a uh, Mark Bolin tribute, and oh. uh, with okay. that one, uh, I, I just I was helping Hal out a bunch with logistics and back end stuff. And at one point, Devendra Banhart. His bass player didn't have an upright bass, and so called me and was like, "Hey, can we use your bass?" And I sat there. The guy was not well. Let me always say kind of things. I, I I believe that if he had called me in to just do the session, I could have uh, played a, a lovely part on it. But uh, the guy the guy did a, a perfectly good job, and the recording is beautiful. And that's really the the end result of that one. That that's that that well that's an interesting story uh mm -hmm. and uh, uh part of angel headed hipster what i read on your website is they also like a, besides nikkei was you two and alton john were you playing no, that, that was, that was, well? uh, I, uh, I didn't get to meet uh, i wasn't part of that they did those sessions in england ah okay got it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's um uh, well like a cool 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 stories i would love to hear you play a little bit more do you have something that you can oh, show geez. us. Sure. Um, All right. Let's see. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll just do some more slap stuff, yeah? Let's go. Uh...
All right. Yeah. Um, Jacob Faulkner, everyone. Uh, we were talking a little bit about, about uh, Snap, Slap, and um, uh, different names like for for different patterns and i would like to uh, for, uh you to tell me what is the how what, what what is the terminology that you're using and also to demonstrate different slab based sure patterns thing. that you use sure thing. so for me a snap is out of, out of, uh, like a bar talk snap so i'm just grabbing the string and uh pulling it back and having the strings uh come down and then a slap is a is a non uh, noted. Uh, it's a it's a it's a yeah, I'm coming down on the neck. So snap, snap, slap. And when I talk about a single, uh, I'm talking about like a. So that's a single, and then the double being. And then the triple or, or the triplet. Um, that's when that was one of those things that I. I slowed down your videos when I was learning how to play and watch the, the circular motion of a and when I started out I had this huge motion of a and I learned how to get it, you know basically uh, basically into my wrist so it's a much more concise gesture otherwise you can't get the like that kind of stuff going. Now I've always used steel strings. I I I uh I know guts are easier but uh, I do the bow work too, and the, the tone. It just I, I like I like the I like the sound and the feel. Everything about the steel string agrees with me better. I use spiral cores, um, and then there's the quadruplet. Uh, to go back to the technique we were talking about, and that I've only got I've I've never. And what I'm doing there, I'm going snap. Coming down with, I'm kind of karate chopping down, coming down with this part, and then doing my regular slap. So it's one, two, three, four. And uh, those, so just to those... make sure, like you do, oh, uh, do you want to say something? No, no, you, you go ahead. Uh, so just to make sure, like, so when it's a uh, one note, you call it snap, but yes. when it's a uh, note with the hit uh you call that single yeah yeah and double you call when it's uh uh note and two hits yes so you're counting the hits until that point yeah and from and the triple it's also the same number of but it's but it's in a yeah it's it's divided into a triplet as opposed to a um, okay. So. And for the quadruple, you're also then you're switching to counting both note and hit. Yes. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. I, I, you know what's funny is I never thought about that. But yeah. Uh, and okay. So, I mean, uh, is is there a reason why you do that that way? Uh, not a logical one. It's just always okay. like how I thought about it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I like asking these these questions because you know it's it's. It just, These it, things it, it, are it, it, all it, it, over the place. I want to make them as structured as possible, and I'll probably, you know, like, you know, make like one one video all about it, and then make sure that you know, kind of, we all use it. Um, I mean, for me, it never really mattered, you know, how people call it, as long as they know how to play it, and uh, it's just matter of like easier communication. So it's for me, it's just like I want to see what what is what is behind it like how people come up with a certain uh certain names for for different base patterns is there are there any other uh base patterns slab base patterns that you wanted to demonstrate let's see uh i have a kind of double time triplet that you know so there's a like, Time one will set you up really nicely for a rumba rhythm. You know, uh, that. Uh, so for a triple, right? 
Yeah. In that it's case, it's not a triplet. It's just like uh, uh, it's uh, three eight notes, right? Yeah, and it, okay. it's, again, it sets up really nicely that uh, those, those those Latin rhythms it, it works really well in that world. Uh, that's what you play at the uh, root note every Thursday, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, uh, that that's a that's a fun gig. I really have a good time with that. It's Congo, mm -hmm. and then Zach playing with guitar, and I'm on I'm on bass. That's awesome. Um, I would like to, uh, a little bit to talk about your gear. Uh, so how many bases you have and what are they? So I, I'm i down to just the one upright right now. Um, truth be told, I, I had a second K from the early 50s. Um, that was perfectly fine. Um, but I wanted to buy my wife uh, an, an engagement ring back in the day. So I, I sold the base and got her the ring. And now I've got her as my uh, other thing that I love that's, you know, that I can put my arms around. Um, and then I've got a couple uh, old K electric bases. Like I said, this is a 42 Swingmaster. I've got a two K Speed Demons. Uh, I played through a Phil Jones bass amp. Uh, I love those things. I think they're great. Um, if I'm playing loud, I play with a Realist. And if I'm playing quieter with the trio, I have that fantastic Nadine microphone. Uh, made by Ear Trumpet, and I've actually been recording with that when I've been doing live ensemble stuff uh, lately. So that's been really great. I really love those Nadine mics; they sound amazing. But you, you, but you're you're out of luck if you're with a drum kit. And it's interesting. So you're using Realist if you want to play loud. Is yeah. That what you're huh? You know, I never had luck. Like if I have to play like a big show with drums and you know loud electric guitar. You know, Realist was giving me lots of lots of Feedback. problems. Yeah. So uh, on the back of this, you can see where I taped uh, <laughs> a towel for the one part of the feedback. And then you can see around each F hole that there's tape around each one of those because I would put foam in it. I, I did a lot of things to, to battle that. Uh, the reason why I like the Realist so much is that its response to a bow is um, as big or bigger than the tone of the plucking or the uh, or the snapping. So, uh, speaking of using the bass as this dynamic instrument, if the Americans have a song where we're doing a thing uh, where we need a big, huge section, I can switch to the bow and dig in, and it will all of a sudden function like a synthesizer. You know, it's just this huge big uh, set of, of bandwidth that I get to take up and I can hold it for long periods of time. And I found with uh, the other pickups, they didn't, it would actually get quieter, which is exactly the opposite effect that I wanted to have when I grabbed for my bow. Hmm. Interesting perspective. Interesting mm -hmm. perspective. But I do uh, agree with you. They're not, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's a, I have to make my base look like a, like a pillow fort <laughs> with so much yeah. foam and all that. I noticed that I I I seen that on some some of the photos. I think the one that we used for the flyer. Yeah, I've got the, the uh, um, gray foam that you use from like Home Depot. Uh huh. It's the two. It's these like uh, rectangles of uh, for like air conditioning units or something like that. <laughs> yeah, they have everything at Home Depot. Yeah. Um, a question about your uh, your strings. You mentioned Spiracore? Yeah, yeah, I use the red Spiracore as the mediums. Um, and I, uh, I've i tried Guts and I've tried, a, like, because the Cal Arts, the thing uh, was to do your EA with metal, uh, whatever with steel, and your DMG with gut. Um, and I like that sound, but again, because I'm doing some, uh, because I'm, such a hybrid player between pits and bow and slap, uh, the metal string, the seal strings were just better, especially for the bow work. I agree with that. Yeah, you know, that's probably the reason why I play the steel strings as well, because it gives me, especially to mastics, spiral cords or mm -hmm. other ones, like they 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 give they give you kind of the best balance in between these different styles of playing. Yeah. Also, the, um, the, the, the tone, I find, for my taste, uh, is strongest 
uh, when I when I'm uh, slapping with steel strings. Uh, I, I I find that I don't know if I if I'm if my slap, if you need to change adjust your slap or something like that when you're using guts. But for me, it was always a little squawky and thin sounding, and I really like that deeper, more robust sound. I think it's hard to go to to guts if you're used to, and probably the opposite if you're used to steel. And um, tell you what, though, I, um, it is it is it is constantly humbling to use steel strings because if, if I have a week off and I'm not playing every day, and I come back and I have a, like a three hour gig to slap, I'll have blisters all over again. You know, I've, I've been <laughs> and it's like I've been playing almost you know every day for 15 years or something like that, probably almost 20 now. So it's crazy to think that I can still get, you know, blisters on my hand from, from playing bass after all these years. But the steel strings will remind you. Yeah, that's the uh, name of the game. And I do love playing Guts, uh, and especially if I play old New Orleans stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, my sound is definitely with, with, with steels. Yeah. Um, do you use anything else besides um, besides the gear you mentioned? Mentioned any pedals, any effects? Oh, uh, I'm trying to think. Yeah, so uh, well, you know, they're, uh, my pedals are trade secrets. Uh, if if you want to come by the show, by the show and, and and sneak a glance at what I'm, I'm working with, but uh, that that stuff is uh, you know. For, for the upright, I don't. I, uh, the only thing I'll use is a clean gain boost because the signal is a little weaker out of here than the electric, and I'm switching between the two in the set. So uh, when I'm done with my electric part of it, I'll switch over to the upright, click on the clean boost just to give me a little bit of volume, so I'm, I'm matching, and then go uh, run through from there. But um, I try to keep things really simple in that way. Uh, do you have any particular way to record upright bass, especially slap? Oh, with the slap stuff, um, I think ribbon mics. Uh, I, 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 the, my, my favorite slap tones are from the 20s to the 50s. And those guys were all using, I mean, the 20s stuff, it's, it's those early condensers. But as soon as you hit the uh, early 40s, you start to get the ribbon mics. And it just takes the edge off. Um, but yeah, recording slap is a, is a, is a, is a trick because it can be, you know, cause otherwise you get too much ping and not enough, uh, muscle to it. So I, I think, I think, uh, a 44 or 77, uh, if you can get your hands on one of those old RCAs is the way to go or a, a make a great, uh, repro using uh, new old stock, uh, ribbon tin. So. But uh, my recommendation is get a good mic. <laughs> it's really interesting that you you your favorite sound uh, comes from those records from 40s and 50s, uh, and they all played guts. And then you, your choice of strings is uh, are the steel strings. Yeah, it. Um, I think for me, it it comes from um, again, like uh, because I have to do all three, and. The gut, uh, I, just, I never, I never got any good on gut. I think <laughs> what it is, like, like we were saying, I, I, uh, I, I, I've always just sat, felt like the sound of the steel better. Uh, it, it just, it's always sounded to me more like the old records. Uh, so I, I don't know, I don't know why that is exactly. It's you know, from somebody like you, I would kind of like say like, hey, you know. If, if somebody asked me if I haven't heard you play, I would probably say that your choice would be. Uh, gut strings, but knowing that you play bow with the bow a lot, then okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But even the stuff that you play with the bow, I can see it played fairly nicely on on, on the guts. Mm -hmm. um, since we talk about the old bass players and everything, I would like to hear uh, who are the the biggest influence bass influences on your on your playing. Oh, uh, Willie Dixon, Sam Stewart are two giants for me. Um, Willie Dixon, another one of those guys, uh, like Bill Johnson, just really knew how to snap, you know, and also when to, when to get into rhythms and stuff like that versus just a single note. Uh, and Slam Stewart is, uh, there's a version of Limehouse Blues he does with Illinois Jaquette uh, that floors me. He just, 
it's it's a great example of the Duende. You hear the band come in and everybody's playing good and hot, and uh, then Slam Stewart comes in with this burner of a of a, of a uh, bowed solo, and the band is on another planet afterwards. Uh, also, that singing while you play is, um, if you can do it, is is remarkably cool. I love that sound. So those those two guys were huge for me. Um, when I was studying at Cal Arts, I loved Gary Peacock because everybody loves Gary Peacock and all the all the other jazz greats. Uh, Dorsey Burnett uh, was a big influence on me for my rockabilly playing because he does a lot of uh, you know like more like a. I had never really thought about doing that. I was only going, you know, and the idea of, of doubling on on the tonic and the five was sort of a, that's a really cool way to keep the tempo going, you know, the double timing uh, rhythm without it being as busy as, you know, these, these notes constantly moving. I really liked that idea, uh, especially when you, when somebody's taking a solo and you want to, you know, if I'm going, and now it's like a solo and I want to lift it up as we were talking about the different rhythms and everything giving that effect. If I go, Uh, then I'm giving more space for the lead player to, you know, I'm less busy, but I'm also upping the intensity. And I really like that. And that was something that, that, uh, that Dorsey, uh, Johnny Cutler would do a lot. Well, there was Bob Moore on bass. Oh, is that Bob Moore on there? But, but, but it's, yeah, it was quite I, But I thought Dorsey was playing bass. Oh, it, it was, it's those sessions where they kicked Paul and Dorsey out, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, those are like the in Nashville sessions, but you know, it's um, it was it's, it's it was hard like to, to determine all of these, but like some of th those things are in uh, Bob Moore's studio book, and then he wrote all the sessions that he did. So you can go basically song by song. Go, go see, go see that. It's all good to know because I, I knew that it wasn't Paul on those. Uh, yeah, and you can see so, it in his playing. It's uh, a little tricky. It's it's kind of all over the place, but yeah. yeah. You know, I I put my work into it and found out like as much as I, I possibly could. But it's I I would say that it's impossible to say for sure for each song. But you know, for that particular style, it's definitely Bob Moore. Uh, you you could you could hear my playing and be like, that's the Bob Moore thing. That's great. Uh, <laughs> also, and then of course you know there's guys like Bill Black. There's this uh, newer guy, uh, George Sjepovich. He was really influential in uh, my. Ex in expanding my my plane. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> uh, so I, th that's my next question. So, from the the current bass players, uh, current slappers, uh, who would you like to mention as your influence or people um, that you like playing slap? Yeah, uh, that is a very good question. Um, there's uh, Kevin Smith over in Austin, who's Brilliant. George Sjepovich uh, is another favorite. Um, it's not that I, uh, I, I guess I just, I don't, I don't know a lot of other slap bass players. Uh, I mean, I, I, we, we, you, see, you see him around and you shake hands and you say, it's good to meet you. But um, there's a lot, I, uh, you know, uh, as far as name recognition, I can think of you and Kevin as, as my two main guys. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I love Kevin. Kevin is great. You know, I, I just saw him a month ago or something in in Austin. Whenever I go there, I make sure they to to shake hands. Yeah. With me. he took a solo on an Asylum Street Spankers record, that old uh, string band that was uh, a goal of mine for a long time <laughs> to learn to, to learn that one. It was which which one is it? I think that he recorded a couple of solos with the with the Spankers. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I, like it was, it was one of those things that I found in high school because you know I, they were doing those dirty ditties and all those all those kind of raunchy tunes. That was really cool when you were like 16, 17 years old. I mean, they're still cool now, but they were they were explosively. Uh, I really like them too. You know, when I moved to San Francisco, I, I I made sure to go to every show, and it was really fun. It's always a different lineup, though, but it was really fun. <laughs> but, you know, it's the same way. Uh, it always kind of reminded me of the Memphis Jug Band in that way. Uh, you know, Will Shade would 
actually pimp out maybe two, three bands in Memphis on a night that were all the Memphis Jug Band. I mean, they were all technically players who had been on a session or something like that. But you know, you could you could uh, you could work it like that, which I always thought was amazing. I know that you uh, compose music uh, a fair amount. Do you compose for your bands as well? Uh, yeah, so the Americans, we all get together and we have these um, very challenging and very rewarding writing sessions where we'll be together for a week or two at a time, living somewhere lovely and just waking up and writing music from like 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And so we're all coming together and we're bringing in ideas and, com and composing together. And then uh, with La Lome, it's, it's uh, more Zach is, because Zach's on the guitar and he's kind of speaking for the band. So he's, he's composing more of it. And I'll follow, oh, let's do this, you know, harmonic gesture. Let's go uh, five, four, two, one. But like, actually let's go, let's go flat two, one. So, you know, you know, so those are the ideas that I'm throwing around in that group. Uh, and then with composing on my own, um, my wife is an actress and so oftentimes she'll get attached to a project and they'll say you know we're, we're looking for some music and i'll i'll submit and see what happens i've gotten uh i've, I've done a few uh, a few of her friends films now which has been great uh and that stuff is uh lovely it's it's, it's it feels I'm, i'm really grateful that i started on bass when i switched uh, when, I, when i've been trying my hand at composition for the fact that Like we were talking about your we are bus drivers we are keeping things on the road and we're, we're turning people this way and we're turning people that way and that's what you know uh film composition is is so much about is that i'm you're coloring the the, the scene that's happening the the important part is what's being shown and that's the lead guitar and the singer and all of that and then we're just making sure that people know where to look and and how to feel And that, uh, that understanding, I think, really comes a lot from the power that the bass has to be big and quiet and guide the direction of the song, you know, between the rhythm and the timbre and all that stuff we were talking about. What would you say, by your opinion, what are the, the most essential slap bass recordings? Most essential slap bass recordings? Uh, oh... Uh, I mean, some personal favorites are uh, Liza Pull Down. For you, the Shade. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one I want to know. Yeah. Liza Pull Down the Shade. Uh, um, Plucking the Bass is another all time favorite. That, there, there's that compilation that came out, uh, How Low Can You Go? And that thing is stupendous. That really rocked my world when I heard that. To hear that good collection of old um, slap bass work, mostly. Um, let's see. Other, oh, that one is know, my favorite too. It's it's. I, I think it goes up to 1939. I think that yeah. the last one is like when uh, when um, uh, oh now I'm like now I'm blanking out like uh, with uh, uh, Sepia Panorama with uh, Duke Ellington. Yeah, I think that's the latest latest song. Um, the that kind of like this is yeah to, to hear. Stop to hear Um, and then there's also what's one of the best parts of, of that compilation is it really shows a lot of the uh, Afro-Caribbean stuff. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with clips on music um, and uh, music from Trinidad, like all, all, that, all that whole, all the, all the Caribbean stuff and uh, everything from the Lekwana Cuban boys out of Cuba to, uh, you know, all the, the Mighty Sparrow and Lord and Vader and all those, all those guys. Uh, and also you get, uh, oh, I've lost um, Stelio from uh, Martinique and all these, all these incredible players that are uh, using this. It just, it's amazing how essential and understood slap bass was uh, until the end of the 50s. You know, that every, like all around the world, everybody knew how to slap. And then yep. Yep. after after the end of uh when, when the electric bass came in it just disappeared it didn't even it didn't you know pits and 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 bows stayed around but slap evaporated it seems and it was it was the way to play for, for most people because you had to cut above the band i absolutely love that one and i love the calypso stuff it's it's 
it's it's great. And I I, I forgot I, I think in the bass player on most of those Calypso recordings was Al Morgan, right? I think so. If it was uh, he was he was part of um, Houdini's band, right, in New York. I, I I think so because I think that most of those Calypso recordings were done in New York. Yeah. If I remember correctly, but it's yeah, so it's it's, it's, uh, it's that impossibly good band of like Lionel Velasco, Houdini, um, and and Al on on bass. It's it's really something. Speaking of great New York bass players, uh, there is the recordings of Emmett Miller uh, doing the Ghost of the St. Louis Blues with um, oh, I've just lost his name, but he has that great. <laughs> One of my favorite intros uh, for that tune. It's whoever is interested in slab bass should definitely get the that compilation. I'm not sure if it's available yet, but you know, as soon as it, it was available, I bought. I think I bought it in pre uh, as a pre order. I was so excited about it. I, had, yeah, I, and I, I, I already had all those all those songs and knew all these stories, but even the the whole package is super nice. If I ever yeah. get rid of all my CDs, I'm going to keep that one. Yeah. Uh, oh, Paul Brown from uh, uh, the Whiteman Orchestra. Uh, that version of Dino uh, mm -hmm. that's on there is killing with that. Uh... That major seven, so cool. Love it's that. uh you're missing one uh one roll slap uh and it's I... brown but not paul brown and where is it is, is it there no it's dum 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 trang tang tang there well we'll figure that one out later <laughs> you'll yeah. have to correct me on that i'll let you know on thursday I just packed my bass so since I'm going like to 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 a session right after the slap stream, so uh, I don't have it here with me. Um, yeah, I love that. You know, it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's with Gene Colgate Orchestra. That's uh, right. That's not, right. It's not uh, and uh, because Steve Bryant, I, I know why, why I mixed it up. Steve Brown after after uh, uh, he left Gene Col Colgate Orchestra. He joined Paul Whiteman Orchestra. Gotcha, uh, gotcha. Paul Whiteman. But, yeah, because that version of Diamond Gene Colgate. You're right, absolutely. Yeah, Paul Whiteman was the one that that got like half of Gene's band, and you know, to mm -hmm. to to join him. And Steve Brown was one of those, and um, and Dinah is absolute favorite. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, so it's it's an amazing one. Um, yeah, I can talk about that. Those early recordings, you know forever mm -hmm. <laughs> i love it and it's uh it's not not many people mention like all that calypso stuff and first time i found out about it was through mark rubin he was the one that gave me uh in the early 2000s he gave me uh like some recordings and just names and then i then i and i found those records it was not even he telling me actually in person i read the article that he wrote for for bass player magazine, it was an acoustic abuse by Mark Rubin and essential slab bass stuff. Yeah, that was it. It was uh, I, that's how I discovered lots of calypso. Yeah, that's so, that music is so wonderful. Uh, my my wife's mother, my mother in law, is uh, is from Trinidad by way of uh, by way of England, and uh, her her grandmother was amazing. She was studying locust migration in in Trinidad and had four children there um, uh, and they were all just sunburned all the time basically because they're all British but uh, we're, we're, we always talk about going down to Trinidad and I want to go to the carnival so badly I just I love that music it's 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 amazing uh, so we talked about slab bass recordings from other people but what would you say what are the recordings that, that you did that represent your slab bass playing the best uh, you know, that's a good question. Um, I don't actually get to as much slap bass playing as I do. Uh, there's not a ton of recordings that represent it. Uh, the Americans have never really recorded their rockabilly stuff. And then the stuff that I do with them uh, will be... Uh, there's a song called Stowaway that we do that 
actually has a, has a displaced five rhythm um, that I'm, I'm very proud of and I think something you would like. It. So it's, it starts with a kind of a double thing. It'll be like a... And then, we, so that, that's how our verses go. Uh, but then it's got this... But yeah, as far as slap stuff goes, I've never really, I've never, I don't, I don't have a single slap solo recorded, for, for example, because uh, because like I said, I've always just been more of the uh, the bus driver. Next next record, some slap bass solos. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Or you know, or a slap bass record if if the rest of the band is not. Very fun. You know, I, uh, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll first record that tune Ryu and we'll go from there. All right. I like that. Um, please let me know so I can share it all over the place for all the slappers in this world to see it. Um, since we're talking about slap, I have like a few more questions that I want to ask you about that. Um, you played with a bunch of bands and with a bunch of different band leaders. Um, did you ever have anybody telling you, hey, can you? slap can you just don't slap or can you slap less or <laughs> or can or can you just slap you know um, stuff like that I've, I've definitely been told uh don't I've, I've been told both things i think more often than not it's a uh, you know um slap in that section not this section is usually the conversation that will happen um yeah singers well singers are on their own planet of course uh but they it just depends on if they if they appreciate a slap or not. Um, out of the groups that I've been in, it's really just learning when it's appropriate. I think is the main thing. You know, because because like we were saying, it's such a uh, it's a strong spice. It's like it's, yeah, it's it, overwhelming. It could be overwhelming. Yeah, but it's interesting. You know, when you play, you know, with rockabilly bands and you play like three pizzicato notes, and you're like, oh come on, can can, can you just slap all the time? Yeah, <laughs> and it, you know you, you you or the opposite you 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 play almost everything pizzicato and with a bow and then it's like hey can, and then can you, you know, have a few notes of slapping ah, maybe it's too much. Yeah. It's funny with the Kingston trio. Um, I'll I'll slap basically when I want the audience to clap along. Ah, interesting. So uh, they 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 associate the snap with the percussion of of, of a clap along. Got it. Interesting. So I'll I'll use it as kind of an I can instrument see that. to 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 feed the audience what to do. I can see that. Um, huh, cool. Um, do you have an advice since you are comparable to the rest of my guests, probably in the younger uh, half of the guests? What would be? So I'm he interested to hear your perspective. Um, what would you say? What would be the best advice for younger uh, bass players to find the gig these days and find a band like to join? Um, push your music you like on your friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did. I, I got obsessed with early music and I just uh, pushed it on everybody I knew and then soon found that people were saying, hey, you should meet this guy or this guy you should... Uh, hang out with. And I, I kind of forced the world I wanted to be in uh, around me. Um, I'd say also uh, be good uh, at your instrument and don't be late, uh, both both in, in timing and also uh, in, in your rehearsals. Uh, I've, I've been, uh, when somebody says rehearsals at one, that means be there at 12:50. Downbeat is at one, uh, and that learning learning that skill uh, is is invaluable. Also, know when not to play your instrument. Uh, this was the lesson I learned very dearly. I was doing a, a project with Hal Wilner again in, in New York, and um, the great uh, Steve Bernstein, who runs Sex Mob, that jazz group, was uh, the band leader. He's as good as it gets. 
That guy is an unbelievable musician. But I was nervous because I was hanging out with all these really serious cats for the first time. So I'm kind of uh, doing this while he's taught while people are getting ready. And he turns to me and he says, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this once. And it's uh, because I like you and because you're, you're new here. But unless we're all playing, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that straightened me up. You know, and it's it's true. I, I you know, I'm sure like everybody else, uh, I've uh, watched the Beatles documentary. Uh, I just noticed how much noise there was in this rehearsal of just the guy. I mean, it's fun to see them messing around and all that, but there's like times where there's just people just doing stuff, and it's you know, it's it's distracting. Uh, and it's like if you can just not play your instrument, it shows that you're focused and serious. It's a really good and uh, technique to have to show up and, and just sit with your instrument until it's time. I like that. Uh, although I do like those Triton distractions, but it's... I, I, I mean, they, they, I they have their right. place, uh, but yes. it's like a certain point. Um, I remember one time with the Americans, we did this terrible thing to ourselves we had like a six hour drive and we decided we were going to find the worst music ever so we spent the entire drive listening to bad music on purpose arguing over what was the worst song and by the time we got to uh, our gig we were all like sick physically from listening to all this bad music for so long um and i think it's the same way with uh rehearsal you have to be careful with your bandwidth you'll if you want to play good music, you need to be listening to good music and you need to, and when you're not, then let silence be a thing or let the person who's talking uh, hold the attention. You don't need to be nervously running things up and down. I can, yeah, yeah, definitely, that definitely, definitely happens. Um, since you talk about the Americans, uh, you mentioned Americans, and I have a couple other questions regarding Slap. Uh, but as far as Americans go, how many albums have you guys recorded? So we have one uh, record officially out with loose uh, music over in England, and that's mm -hmm. the what's called "I'll Be Yours," and that's our official uh, as a you know contemporary band. But we've got you know three records before that that. Uh, all home recordings and, and all kinds of, of projects along the way, all the demos. The one that I have, like that, it has that kind of like an envelope uh, paper cover. Is that the first album? That, so that, uh, God, that, was, that, that was our first uh, our first EP. So we've got a string okay. of EPs. Um, and then uh, we went into the studio uh, about, God, like almost five years ago and did. Uh, did all be yours. And when we finished that record cycle, we finished our new record, um, uh, which is going to be called Staying True. Uh, I hope I'm not revealing anything too exciting with that information. Um, <laughs> and then the pandemic happened. So we were, so we sat on a record for two years, uh, which was, which was a drag, uh, but now it's finally coming out and we'll, we'll be doing that whole dance for that. Um, and that will be our second full length. But uh, between home recordings, uh, we put out maybe two more EPs, I think. Okay. Yeah. So are, are you guys on a label now? We're with Loose Music over in England. Oh, okay. Uh, and they're an Americana label. Uh, Courtney Marie Andrews is with them. Gil Landry, who's a, a good buddy of ours. Um, Gil's a fantastic songwriter. I should have mentioned him earlier. Nice. Yeah. Um. As far as the Americans, what would you say? What is the highlight of your career with them? Oh, um, one of them was definitely the Hal Wilner uh, show that we played with Nick Cave at. Uh, just to get to be a part of a Hal Wilner production was a dream come true for all of us. Uh, both Patrick and I were his godsons. So that was really thrilling. And to grow up listening to his music and being a part of all of that. Um, we've gotten to meet a lot of our uh, heroes. We've gotten to play with you know all the guys from the Blasters and X and that kind of stuff, and that was really thrilling. But the best part of being the Americans uh, was touring the country and getting to go to places that you'd never get to go to. See, find the secret barbecue spots, find the uh, and have people take you in. 
Uh, and America is not quite in that place right now, which is heartbreaking. I don't know what the remedy to that is, but we had a sort of passport into uh, a part of the world that we wouldn't ever have normally been allowed into as a bunch of California boys. It's, um, yeah, I'm super bummed that, that touring is non-existent at this point yeah. and you mentioned barbecue that's one of my favorite things to do on <laughs> um, on, on tour go to lockhart in texas yeah now i can go like to yeah i'm like very detailed about barbecue yeah. I, I love it it's we, we can share some stories about it uh some other time we, we do not talk about the bass and slap bass and music um but you with the americans you played um a few of these big time late night shows i was hoping you were going to mention that as oh, well oh yeah of course so we we did uh we did uh um we did late night with uh letterman that was really great that was again through hal for the son of rose gallery record and um you know uh also we've had some really great opening days we've we've i mean got to uh play at uh some huge venues in england opening up for the gypsy kings which is really funny um to go out there in front of like five thousand english moms and uh and get to play for them also ryan bingham took us out a ton of times and uh getting to play billy bobs in fort worth was was a real experience um yeah i've gotten to play some you know proper big shows and yeah with, with letterman that was that was great um but it was it was just fun to be in new york uh, under those kind of circumstances when you're touring and you get to feel like you're uh when, you, when you're in a major metropolitan and you're in a band that's really doing something that that feels great that, that's one of the great feelings it makes you kind of feel relevant in a way I think yeah like I, I i'm not just a tourist i'm, I'm here with a purpose it's um yeah it's 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 the best feeling um as far as bass go like what would you say are the most common mistakes that uh that you notice from other bass players that they do uh, that you bad left hand point technique. out uh what is that uh bad left hand technique and also bad right hand technique and i don't mean to be a stickler about it but like i watch a lot of guys uh play like play upright like it's electric and it's your your tone will be so much better if you you know play with the side of your finger and come down and use the weight of your arm and your body leaning over it to dig in and then uh the left the, uh, the left hand stuff breaks my heart because you're going to hurt yourself if you if you play a bad technique um also i'm i'm a bass player who plays behind the beat uh you know that's, that's my natural place and even my slap is is almost lackadaisical like uh, you, you've got such a tight crisp uh, forward-looking slap, and I've, I've never been particularly. I've, I've noticed that because when I'm slapping, I'm kind of got this like it's all back here, and I, I noticed a lot of like uh, what I'm say that there's a lot of different a lot of different ways placement of that kind of thing, and it took me a long time to learn how to play more forward, uh, and I noticed that uh, on the flip side, you 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 know you you can do everything. There's a lot of guys who can't lean back far enough. And so you get that kind of jagged, rushed feel. So I'd love to see people practice more leaning back, but that's just my taste. I like that you mentioned that. And then for me, moving to 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 the States, it was really kind of, in, in a way, revealing because I noticed that it's people play the same style of music a little differently here. Uh, and it, it, it being that jazz or rockabilly, and you know, if you play it even with top musicians in Europe, it's a little bit different. It's uh, the the hear that backbeat, especially if you're playing traditional uh versions of this, this particular styles, is um, is more on the back and um, and I love it. I mean, I love it either way, but it's you know, I think that my my personal playing changed after i moved out here mm -hmm. and playing with all these old school um bass players before the gig do you have any ritual how you warm up your hands or you just go at it 
oh, I'll run a couple scales. Uh, if I, if I'm if if the gig is <laughs> this is terrible to say, but if the gig is sort of important enough, and I need to like if I need to focus, like today when I knew I was going to be playing for you, I was running my major scale step up and down, making sure my intonation wouldn't be too bad. When I got here today, that I kind of lost my intonation a little bit, which was you know mortifying, but. Uh, Yeah, it's just sort of running basic hand stuff and just making sure I get loops. And, you know, these stretches are always good. And there's that one where you open up your shoulders with that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's a great story of uh, somebody was talking to Ray Brown and he was a, lived on the top floor and the guy had to go up these flights of stairs and he heard Ray burning up and down on scales. And he comes to the top of the stairs and he says, man, what are you doing? You're Ray Brown. You're the world's best bass player. Why are you practicing your scales? And he says, that's exactly why I'm the best bass player. <laughs> I like that story. Mm -hmm. Scales are important. Uh, and since we're talking about practicing, so, so during your career, what are the scales that you usually practice? Like really practice? Like majors or you do, you know, minors as well? Do you have, do you, do you practice the metal? The main thing I would try to do is harmonic to, minor, bebop scales. What do you practice? Yeah, I do uh, a lot of kind of triad based stuff. Uh, and the main thing I'm trying to do is try to figure out new ways to finger things and try to figure out how. Because I would love to be such a good player that if I have a new line that I'm playing, that my technique leads me to the logical conclusions, you know, that my pinky is the last note that I'm pivoting at the right time. So I work a lot, uh, I've been working a lot lately on trying to uh, intelligently move around the bass so that my hands are always uh, ergonomically safe. You know, and so I'm not running up the neck with my pinky going the whole way. I'm uh, ending up where I need to be uh, at, at the right time and trying to get that to be unconscious. Uh, do you have anything that you would say is essential to practice uh, and that there's something that you would recommend for other bass players to practice besides scales? Uh, a metronome? <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. But man, if you spend a couple of weeks doing that, it, you're just playing it so much better. It just, it changes things night and day. And what I will do personally is I'll kind of learn the piece and then, and then I'll sit down with the metronome because I, I find it so little fun to learn it with the metronome. And I know that I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot because I'm learning some bad stuff along the way. But um, really sitting down with the metronome is one of those nights. It's just, it's, it's putting in the work. And um, also learning the power of the open G string. You know, that I, I'm... I come to grips with the fact that I'm up here, but I like using the open G string to get down and recognizing that that open string gives you all this time to, to move your gestures around. Uh, that it, it's one of the best pivots you can have uh, going high to low is using that open G. It's, it seems that you know all of us are kind of like stuck in a in a in a in a this in a in the particular way when we practice and then you know i want to make sure that you know i can hear from all of you like what is your um uh, best recommendation for practicing especially on a on, on a daily basis um i have like one more question for you after uh, like after this but is there anything else that you want to mention is there anything that i missed no i think we we, we covered it pretty well um i uh I'm just looking forward to playing more bass in my life. <laughs> it's what it breaks down to. I'm glad we that you turned over uh, do, Since we're talking about that, do you mind playing another piece for us? Oh, I mean, if, you, if, if you guys are asking, I don't know what I'll, I'll do, though. I'm asking. I will love it. <laughs> um, let's see. Play something for you and see you a couple times. Uh...
small all right, man. Um, all right so my last question that i always ask like to all my all my guests is you've been playing bass for you said like almost 20 years you've been doing music for a long time what inspired you to still do what you do after all these years <laughs> I'd say uh, music is incredible. Uh, it, it, it puts voice to um, thoughts and feelings and emotions. I, I, I think about, uh, I've been listening a ton to uh, Dvorak's uh, um, American uh, Quartet and the, the beauty and joy and sadness that he expresses in there uh, if I can play something that beautiful, or if I can even better yet write something that beautiful, uh, that's what I'm striving for: is is to uh, voice the voiceless. And it 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 sure beats digging ditches, and I've I've, I've done my my share of that kind of work too. So I'd much rather play music. We all do. Uh, thanks so much for being a part of the slap stream. Uh, 69th episode of the endless slap bass source that's now on YouTube. Um, I can't wait to hear you play. You know, hopefully, you know, maybe even this week, you know, in Roosevelt, uh, yeah. if not like one of the upcoming upcoming weeks. And um, I would love to hear you play with the Americans as well. Say hi to all the guys in the band. And um, good luck with everything and can't wait to see you. Yeah, thank you so much, George. It's really an honor. Of course. Yeah. All so right. Bye. Bye. All right. That was 69th episode of the Slap Stream with George. Thanks so much for uh, joining us. And um, thanks so much for uh, uh, Jacob, Jake Faulkner, for being with us for... Um, on this uh, 69th episode. Uh, special thanks goes to all the Patreons, to uh, Patreons, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, Dan Rondo, Jose Arana, Etienne Bruze, Mikey, Paul Monroe, Evely, Richard Trail, Scott Owen, Bob Cullen, Kurt Reebok. Join them. Check out my Patreon in the description of this video. Uh, I always sound, always feel weird when I do like this regular YouTuber things because I'm a bass player. I'm a sled bass player. I want to be on the road, not in front of the this little thing. Um, but this is it for now. And um, uh, please check out all the ways to to uh, support the slap stream, to support my career. Uh, PayPal and Venmo links are in the description of the video of this video as well, and uh, also merchandise if you want to check out the all these base T-shirts. I have like a few more ideas, and if you have some, please uh, email at contact at artofslabbase dot com, uh, and I'll see which ones I like. If you have any suggestions, who I should uh, feature for the future slab stream episodes, uh, right in the under this video as well. And um, don't forget, never fret. Slide it in smooth and keep it in a groove. I'm George, and I will see you next Saturday.